All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is day six, the final day of Radio Row, and this is Radio Row on location. I have a very special guest. He is a rapper, um, a, 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 a comedian, you know what I'm saying, a boxer, a, 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 a philanthropist, a, a politician. Uh, we, we have a lot to discuss tonight, and with me is the great Charleston White. I really appreciate your time. I know we had to do a lot to try to make this interview happen, but I'm glad we did. Uh, first of all, what brings you to Las Vegas, Nevada? Uh, this, this oh, yeah. Bring that down. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you got uh, Yeah, the, the Super Bowl. Uh, I wanted to come enjoy the fest, uh, the fest, the Super Bowl's festivities. Okay. Um, uh, as well as uh, I signed a podcast deal with a uh, Green Room Radio. Nice. Uh, with executive producer True, uh, out here. So I come out here at least three to four times a month now to stream. Uh, and record my podcast. So, what's that podcast about? Uh, it's called it's called the Game Related Podcast, and Game is an acronym for Guidance Above My Emotions. And so, uh, I, I I take a I take a uh, I take a scripture out of the Bible uh, okay. that that my mother used to always quote to me that that she says that you overcome everything by the power of your testimony. So, I like to get people on the podcast and kind of kind of interview them where I like to capture their backstory, which ultimately is the testimony, the things that they've gone through in life, their overcome, things that they overcome, their failures, their successes, uh, as well as their triumphs. Uh, and just try to try to ask normal questions to to to, to normal people uh, that end up becoming extraordinary stories. When you talk about that for yourself, what would you say allows you to have those conversations with someone like what are some of the things that you feel like you've overcome in your life that that gives you the credibility to talk to you know to, to talk with folk about that uh but based on my what, what we like to say uh in, in in the college research world uh my qualitative experiences uh okay. my, my my experiences in life over trying to use big words <laughs> on me. uh but but no that's that's ultimately my, my my life experiences uh the things that i've gathered from life uh that that i've learned uh whether that's been from from wrong choices, uh, uh, hanging with the wrong people, uh, uh, o o overcoming uh, those bad choices and decisions, uh, and, and utilizing uh, the things that I learned from from overcoming uh, those bad choices and decisions to to help other people, and that's mainly young people. So I was a troubled youth, right? Okay. So uh, I, I like to describe myself as a as a as a black kid who grew up in America in, in what I call. It's non-traditional, but it became the traditional uh, uh, African-American household, which was a single parent household yeah. uh, in, in those 80s. Uh, I had a great loving mother, God fearing, uh, patriotic, uh, who tried to instill uh, morals, you know, good morals and values uh, in, in her two boys. But but ultimately she had to work. Yeah. And, and, and so by that. uh a lack of parental supervision causes you to go outside when you're not supposed to be outside, uh, watch things on television that your parents normally wouldn't let you watch. And so the cultural influence end up becoming in competition uh, and in contrast to the things that my mother uh, was, was teaching us. And so uh, you're thinking about the black exploitation era, mm. uh, some of the movies we had back during the, Exploit black exploitation era, yeah. Uh, Superfly, the Mac, uh, uh, come back, Charleston Blue, uh, Penitentiary One, Penitentiary Two, so penitentiary three. Yeah, yeah, Penitentiary Three. So, so while while some kids was admiring uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Magic Johnson, uh, we was admiring Too Sweet, yeah, because he could box in prison and he was the prison boxing champ. Uh, we was admiring uh, Goldie from the Mac. Because yeah. there was a resemblance of, of guys like gold in our neighborhood, whether that was our uncles, the guys that live across the street. Yep. Uh, and, and so Confucius once said that he who controls images con controls minds. And so uh, the culture end up shaping uh, the minds of our youth. Uh, and then after the black exploitation era, uh, here come gangsterism. And so once gangsterism was introduced, uh, being smart in school didn't seem cool no more. It's interesting because a lot of stuff that you described was me growing up. You know, my mom, uh, at the age of eight, she became a single mother. You know, her and my father had divorced, and so she had to raise four four kids. And then on top of that, she became like the, uh, I won't call her old because she wasn't old, but she was like the old woman that lived in the shoe. So many relatives ended up living she with us. She had the nieces and nephews Nieces, coming over nephews, there, yeah. brothers, sisters. 
two of my brother's baby mamas at the same time. Oh yeah. <laughs> now, now that's uh now that's a situation right there that you don't ever want to be a part of that. But you know, but she but that's that's the type of woman she was, the type of heart that she yeah. had, uh, to open up her doors uh, uh for people like that. And so no, I, I get that. When when you were growing up, who was it that you looked up to? Uh my mom my mom's old, older brother. So so I had a I had an array of uncles, right? So I had my uncle Joe. Um, I had Uncle Wayne, I had Uncle Boosie, and and, and, and my granddad w- was a military guy uh, who, who was the oldest of, of, of 17 children uh, who went into the Air Force, and he was the first one to migrate out of the country in, into Fort Worth. So my granddad, uh, my granddad owned a barbershop. So I spent a lot of time at, at the barbershop. So uh, I, I was exposed to the the street hustlers, yeah. uh, you know, looking out the window, watching them come into the barbershop talking on the phone and so my mom had an older brother who was a who was a direct influence on 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 his nephews uh because he was a pimp and so that was a that was uh as far back as i can remember that's that's who and what he was how did how did even looking up to him keep you from you know turning the wrong direction in life uh it, it didn't because because he he he's the uh he was the rotten apple in the bunch mm. uh, who was saying, don't listen to your mother. She don't know what she was talking. She don't know what she's talking about because he's a pimp. And, and, and not only was he, he, he was a, he, he was a pimp. He was a womanizing pimp uh, who was abusive toward women, uh, whether that was in, in, in being physically abusive or in, 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 in his ideology. And, and, and so as, as most uh, negative as most uncles who have negative influences on, on their nephews, uh, they try to instill in them those traits and characteristics. A question for you, though. I get the pimp part and the womanizing, but still with him having a sister, there's still a certain mindset that, you know, you'll, you'll treat these women like that, but you're not going to treat your sister. You're not going to let some man treat your sister like well, that. Well, he was in, 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 I once did a, a a presentation, a human trafficking presentation, mm. uh, with the United States Department of Homeland Security, um, Texas Western University, and so I invited my uncle to come out uh, to do this presentation, and I talked about how he had a negative influence on me from from his actions. Uh, I saw shame in in, in an old man. Mm. So, so 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 for him to hear me say this, and I and, and I and I want to openly say this. Uh, he got mama issues, so it was easy for him to be brutal and cruel. Mm. Uh, because he had mama issues from abandonment, and 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 still to this day, somewhat, uh, he still have those issues. Uh, he's the old pimp that can't get a woman, stuck in them old ways. Uh, and his mind is somewhat still stuck back then, right? Yeah. Uh, because he never evolved and grew past that mindset, and so. I, I would wake up at times uh, because my mother is younger than, than my uncle, but my mother was the, the backbone uh, of the family. So I remember waking up at time and, and my mother would be uh, at the aid and the rescue uh, of these women from, from his physical assaults. Where, if you don't mind me asking, where was your father at at the time? Uh, my father was retired from the Navy. So he was, he was battling with, with, whatever men was battling with from coming from, from dealing, being in the military during those times. Uh, so he was in the Navy. Uh, so he struggled with, with some mental health issues from, from the military. And so he was, uh, in and out, he was in and out of my life. When you saw that and then knowing that he had mental health issues, was that something as well that caught your attention? I mean, not at well, a young age, well, but as you grew up. Well, I, we had mental health, the, uh, we had no awareness of it then. So, you know, I was born in 1977. So just even the awareness and talk of mental health didn't come about until within the last maybe 10, 10 or 15 years, yeah. especially from my veterans. Right. Yeah. So, so, uh, I just never heard my mother say anything bad about it. I never heard mama say nothing bad about it. Oh, uh, uh, I, I would hear, you know, family members from, you know, say certain things about, uh, different traits that, that we would uh, apply, but, uh, they would say, I got those same traits. So you don't know if they saying it's bad or good. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask, how do you feel like looking up to your uncle and his ways 
as as a uh, let's say mentored you as it relates to how you treat women? Uh, I I, I became the opposite. Uh, I, I grew up seeing my uncle put his hands on women, and and, and one of the women one of the women uh, I, I believe because he had children by her. In my eyes, she was my aunt. She was loving. She was sweet. Uh, so so I would hear at times, uh, the brutality of, of the beatings in, in in the room, because I was his favorite nephew, and, and he would I, I would spend a lot of time with him, and, and so I remember in the in the eighth grade one time, uh, I called myself slapping my girlfriend, trying to be like Uncle Wayne, uh, and the response that I got from from my mother. Uh, my aunts, uh, some of my female friends that I was real good friends with, uh, it the shame of that. I said, man, I don't want to be like Uncle Wayne, but because I never wanted to be like him. Uh, because I know how I I felt hearing the brutality of the beatings and, and having the empathy, uh, for my aunt, as so to speak. So I I, I never wanted to be that kind of man. I and, and when I grew up and, and saw and, and would, when I grew up and became me and Unc became kind of like two two buddies, two homeboys. And and we could have grown folks conversation and and and, and the level the, the lack of respect that he had for my grandmother, uh uh I it makes me have a lack of respect for him and what he was trying to teach me as a as a as a kid. Did he ever say why he did what he did? Uh my 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 grandfather my grandfather my grandmother was married so my grandfather was in the military uh he migrated from marshall texas out of east texas uh fort worth is a military town so yeah. he, so him and my grandmother owned a, a restaurant slash hotel uh my my uncle blamed my my grandmother so so my grandfather comes from a, a family of military men uh strong country guys who all are married uh, and, 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 and my grandmother comes from the side of the family who, who come from the streets. And, and so uh, ultimately, my grandmother end up uh, being affected the generation. My grandmother's 83, 84 now today. So she was affected with the heroin, the, the heroin generation, the, the jazz generation. Yeah. So so she she was affected by, by 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 that group of addicts. And so my my uncle. They had a perfect life up until they were seven or eight years old. So he blames my grandmother. <laughs> So, so as a grown man, uh, he's never gotten past that. And so that's been his struggle with in and out of prison, addiction, of uh, beating women. So that's been his struggle throughout life. And, and so I never wanted that struggle as a man. So my mother never wanted her two boys to end up like her brother or her father. So she worked hard for us not to become those kind of men. But at times, uncle go come stay with us and feed us the BS while mama gone. Come on, boy, come ride with me, nephew. And, 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 and so so when I started working in the community, that's that's an aspect that I teach from the, the, the black boy who have access to the negative uncle and the influences that the negative uncle or the negative stepdad leaves in sh such a short moment of inter briefly interacting with that child. We're joined by Charleston White uh, on Radio Row on location here in Las Vegas, Nevada. But the Kansas City Chiefs take on the San Francisco 49ers tomorrow in Super Bowl 58. We'll get to the Super Bowl in just a little bit. But, uh, you know, look, there there are things that I want to talk to you about. Of course, uh, you're in a couple of movies. You yes, know, sir. And, and so let, let's just talk. So first of all, why do you want to act? Uh, I've been acting all my life. Yeah, I, was, are, yeah. I, I, I was the class clown. So, um... Uh, I was the kid at home uh, watching all the movies that I told y'all that I was watching. So I could act the Mac. I could act too sweet. Uh, I could act. So when I got to school, I would act in class, acting as the class clown, pretending I'm not as smart as I really am. Mm. I would go to school and pretend that I'm not as smart as I really am, play dumb, ask questions like I don't know. So the teachers would catch on by me asking questions because kids who aren't intelligent don't raise their hand and ask questions a lot. And they're definitely not going to be asking questions that would obviously there get the you answer. Go. Yeah. And, 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 but I'm really distracting class, so I'm being a class clown. Uh, I like attention. I can't play sports. 
Uh, I tried to play the flute, so I was in the band in, okay. in, in the third grade. So I tried to play the flute, so I, I was mu- kind of musically inclined. Uh, and was you a ladies' man when you were in school? Yeah, yeah, I was a ladies' man. Yeah, okay. b- because I was charismatic, and, okay. and and I got to watch the grown folks' movies. So I, I was what what the elder black people would call he's a mannish little boy, you know, because I could cuss like the movies, you know, because I'm sneaking mm. and watching the movies. Uh. So, so I was very charismatic a, as a kid. Uh, my mother, my mother worked at General Motors in, in the early '80s, so we was we was very financially uh, stable with a structured structured life. Uh, and and I'm a likable kid. I'm a likable person, and I'm a people's person. So I thrive off interacting with people. Uh, I just would disrupt class, and, and so and, and so by doing that, uh, my academic talents would stand out as well. Because once once I get in trouble and I have to sit down and do the work, then they start saying, "Well, he 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 been you can do the work." He's smart anyway. Like, oh, he, he, this guy pulling the wool over us. Yeah, and, and so and so, a uh, good teachers learn to utilize my disruptive traits to control the class. Charleston, come here, boy, come pass this paper out. So they, they learn to utilize my disruptive traits to to help control and, and get the class flowing. And so I I'll get to that later. And so in, in school. My mother didn't know I'm acting like this because I would go home and yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. So all of these are acting abilities. Mm. Uh, and so when we would have family gatherings, uh, Christmas time, uh, I, I, I could do the Michael Jackson real good. So I could dance real good. Uh, I'll perform the whole Thriller album, Billie Jean. And, and so I, I wanted to be on Star Search. I wanted to be on put, 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 putting on the hits. So, you know, I, I wanted to be on those shows. Uh only to only to grow up as an adolescent and and become fascinated with this with this this new phenomenon that had introduced to black culture called gangsterism so i wanted to be in movies and act uh even when i started getting in trouble uh, as a kid in the boys home in, in the boys home i did theater was in movies did did plays that that end up being you know filmed in, on a vcr uh, well, we went to a studio, and, and so I played Dr. Ralph Abernathy in the play. So I've always wanted to act. Uh, when I got out, uh, I tried to play a pimp. I tried to pimp. I tried to do like Uncle Wayne, trying to find an identity. Uh, I tried to play gangster. I tried to be a crip. I was just playing. I tried to play killer. Mm. I ain't never killed nobody. I tried to play street, uh, but I had a conscience. So... Uh, all of these things throughout my 20s, by submerging myself in the criminal elements of society, trying to find an identity, right? I'm not a criminal. I'm just trying to find an identity because this is the culture that's propagated to me. I was playing. And, and everybody who knew me, whether it was the juvenile workers, the school teachers, the, the little league football coaches, everybody know me. This kid just playing. He ain't this bad. But he's only acting like this because he's around these kind of kids. I just wanted to fit in. Man, when you talked about, you know, the black exploitation movies or whatever, and I'm sitting there thinking in the 80s, s- somewhere along the way, things changed from the black exploitations to, I think the first movie I think about that you really got, you know, the gangsterism was colors. What? Yeah, and- that changed, that, that, that commercialized it in a way. Yeah. Oh, man, like no other. When we got introduced to colors, it was over with. Yeah. Because we was already prepped those last decade of black exploitation penitentiaries, and they were they were brutal. Eugene, one thing I knew, I wasn't gonna be Eugene if I went to prison. The guy that they made sit down and pee. Oh, pause. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, so we're watching this as uh nine and ten years old, pausing it, rewinding it, repeating it, going outside, playing it. We, we got movies like The Last Dragon. Yep. Bruce yeah. Leroy. Yep. We playing Bruce Leroy too, but the ones that had the left the, that was most impressionable was the Mac, Superfly, yeah. Colors, Penitentiary. So those characters. So I don't know what character I want to play in prison till I see a prison movie. So when I get to school in sixth grade, I'm saying I'm this kind of character when I go to prison. I'm saying this at recess. Because we play, because kids watch the movies, then we go play it. Right. 
your acting. So you're acting Children mimic what they see yep. and repeat what they hear. You're you started a movie called We Out Here. It's a yes, movie sir. about the Atlanta freak Nick. Yes, sir. Uh, it's been nominated for a film festival award and HBO's possibly thinking of tell me a little bit about that because uh, uh, yeah, I call it a gangster uh, gay film. What? A gangster gay film. Oh. Because because it has the elements of, of gangsters uh in the LGBT community with 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 what I like to describe as the gay migration into Atlanta. So 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 from my assessment, uh from my analyzation. Uh, the freak Nick is what brought the migration of Braves into Atlanta. Guys going out there to go free. I know one thing. I, I, I when I was in college, I didn't get a chance to go down. Me neither. Be- because I was five. I was three to five years younger. So we started having the, the Capitol Beach parties in Galveston. Yeah. Yep. So I went to all the Capitol Beach parties, but it was a similar in the remnants of the freak Nick. Same traits, behaviors, and all of that, right? So in, in this movie, we're out here. I call it. The, the, a gangster gay movie because my character in, 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 in Chop, which is another main character, uh, they're the gangsters of the movie. Hmm. And, and we supposed to be at the Freak Nick enjoying all these beautiful women who done came out here. But my gangster killer partner, he mad that the gays here. He got his eyes on the gays. And so we saying, man, well, why are you tripping all the girl? But he mad because he see the influx of it. So we have an altercation and a run in with Amaretta. Uh, Amaretta's in the movie. Uh, and, and one of one of Amaretta's uh, entourage is a gay guy who says something that offends my character, who now is dead, bent and set on killing this guy throughout the whole movie. So uh, it's a it's a great film. Uh, it it. it it showed most people that uh, Charleston isn't uh, what he pre- portrayed to be online. He's not hateful. Or uh, most people, because even the producer, uh, uh, Alex Stone, uh, I was initially supposed to play the guy who was shooting at the gays mm. because they think, or whatever, they think that I'm hateful toward gay people, but I'm not. Uh, my rhetoric may seem like that, but but I'm not. So they put me in this role to play this hateful guy. Uh, toward gay people and in and, and, and the line reading uh, I couldn't tap into the hate so they had to change my part I tried but because it, what, what's in you is it, it, I, I couldn't I couldn't do it I tried to play this role to be mean and hateful toward this gay character uh, I couldn't do it but I didn't know I couldn't do it not the producer but the director says it's not in him he's too cool he has to play. So they switch my role. As an actor, how do you, Kevin, uh, not Kevin Hart, but Cat Williams talked about it, you know, where Hollywood tries to feminize, you know, black men, well, men in general, putting them in a dress and stuff like that. How does Charleston White avoid avoid being uh, in a scenario like that? Uh, I said no. Uh, initially, I, initially, I was, I was trying. Um, uh, Right at the beginning of 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 of, of my takeoff, uh, a year in, into my me being an internet sensation, um, I was being I had signed a contract with with some people. Uh, who was trying to? They test you. Um. Mm. Uh, so, so somebody like me, they feel like should should go through media training. So, so media training uh, sounds like a sounds like a, a legitimate, credible word, right? Yeah. You're going through media training, and, and so they spend a lot of time, uh, I guess, d- depicting you. See what you like. See what you don't like. See what they can get away with. See what they can get away with. Uh, hey, don't say this. Well, okay, do this video like this. So they try to give you a script, uh, subtly. And so in the process of giving you a script, they saying, uh, well, we got to dress you up because the way I dress is not appealing to an, to, to, to an audience that could that could draw 300,000 subscribers. Right. Uh, come on, let's cut your dreads off. Uh, so so if you if you notice my, my clothing in the beginning, I wore a lot of name brand clothes. They had me in Gucci, Fendi. Uh, and, and, and so what I've noticed, the clothes kept getting tighter. And I would hold them up and say, man, I ain't putting that on. Well, just try it on and see how it looks. Well, if you try it on, then that means 
Yeah, so I won't even try it on. Man, I ain't trying that on. Yeah, because something's wrong with that director who wants to see you in that outfit. Come on now. And, just uh, try it on. Well, we we having a photo shoot. Just put this on. So uh th this this is this is what I noticed, and, and this is to answer your question in response to what Kat said about that. We leave our little small country towns or wherever we're from, and we want to make it into Hollywood. We want to be on television, or we we want to be rich and famous. Yeah. So we want we chase this light. Uh, I never came in chasing the light. And and, and what ends up happening is, and, and and this end up happening to some of the most innocent, beautiful young girls. This end up happening to some of the most good natured, good spirited people, uh, who end up becoming horrible people as entertainers yeah. because naturally you have a gift and you have a talent that a god-given gift and talent that could capture the world's attention that's a light whether you can sing dance act play sports but when you leave home you're chasing a bigger light that you think is bigger than the light that's in you hollywood the stage fame being a viral sensation so in the process of trying to get to that light you dim your light. You start doing things, putting your light out to get closer to that light. And just say when you make it to that light, you've done a lot of things to get here. And when you get to that light, it's a horrible individual holding that light, asking you to do things to keep the light. Yeah, because there's someone holding a mirror to your face and, that, that, and you see the reflection. Come on now. And it ain't the same person that Come on. it was when you first, get, so, first got started. So I never came in chasing the light. Uh, because I know there's someone in my in my hometown in my in my life, which is my mother, my wife, my children. They can see this light in me, and if I go do something to put this light out, they don't see the same person when they look me in my eyes, and that's what happened to a lot of our celebrities, a lot of young people, a lot of people who chased this light called rich and fame and they do things to get to the next part to try to get a little closer to the light and from the most part when you get to the light there's not a lot of good people up there it's easier said than done with what you're describing you know you've you know some of the i was talking to uh uh, uh mr hudson you know when we were yeah. coming over here and you know, I think nine billion views on, on, on a particular video. I mean, yeah. when, when when you have that type of stuff where you go viral, and you know you're able to build platforms and stuff off of that, and and build a success off of that, how do you try to stay grounded uh, with all with all that you you know with all that's coming your way? Oh, uh, I, I I show I show my good and bad, but because I know every day somebody's looking and digging up to find something bad. Mm. So, so I'm, I'm, I, 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 I bear my good and bad to the world. Uh, I don't hide my flaws. Uh, I like to go to the, to the, to the gentlemen's club. Some people call them strip clubs. I call them gentlemen's club because I go in and I, I behave. Second home. Me, I behave like a perfect gentleman because that's my second home. And my wife know I go to these places. So if my wife called me, I don't look at the phone and try to hide like I'm not there. I go live in these places. They say, what you doing as a married man? I'm a man. I'm a man. Uh, and, and, and I know as a man, uh, I, I was just telling a, a, a Floyd's boxer, John Easton Jr., that your greatness, homie, your flaws is factored into that too. Mm. So uh, I, I don't want to be perfect. And, 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 and I'm honest enough to tell the internet and, every, and everybody, uh, man, sometimes I want to be wrong. Yeah, sometimes I want to be wrong. Yeah. And, and I'm and I'm man enough to say when I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm wrong. So I'm wrong. Fuck you. I'm wrong. But at some point, I go back and say, man, God, forgive me for doing wrong. Big facts. You're also starring in uh, Wrong Address. That's produced by. Yeah, that's 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 the uh. That's my movie. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm a co-star in this movie, but I, I'm I'm the uh, I'm the main star in this movie called Wrong Address. It's a it's a movie produced by a, some a young brother by the name of Measy out of out of the great Jackson, Mississippi. 
Uh, he have quite a few movies on Tubi. Uh, okay. that has done very well. Uh, he, he's 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 co-written and, and and done a lot of movies with the guy Murder Payne from Detroit. And so, uh, he had an idea of putting me, uh, in the popular rapper out of Dallas, Texas, called Trap Boy Freddie. Mm. Uh, he and I was supposed to, you know, co-star in this movie together, but unfortunately, he had to turn himself in to go do a little time. And so, uh, we continued on with the movie. Uh, it's about. Uh, I play an uncle and a father and a grandfather who uh, my daughter get tied up into some to street mess with a boyfriend. Oh, uh, my grandson ended up getting killed. Uh, the police investigating the case is an old friend of mine. So I end up working with the police to help solve the case. Uh, uh, it's a great movie. And uh, I was surprised that, man, people flew from all around the country to come uh, audition and be in the movie. So uh, I'm really excited about this. You have a streaming collaboration, Underground Railroad Comedy Tour. Talk to, talk to us about that. Uh, yes, sir. So that's Underground Railroad Comedy Tour is a concept uh, that that I came came up with uh, to 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 bridge new comedians into the to the comedy world. So th there's a lot of people on the internet that's funny. Uh, there's a lot of old older comedians that don't don't believe that Country Wayne is is as funny as he is. They don't think Desi Banks is as good as he is because we didn't go their route of of, of being stand up comedians. Right. But our audience, our demographics, our fans think we're funny. And so I, 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 God gave me a vision to recreate the Underground Railroad's path, but in the name of comedy. So chase the same path, the same cities of the Underground Railroad in which we would call the Chitlin Circuit. Okay. And, and, and gather all these new comedians as we go along and ask the Internet who they should who they think should be on here and, and give these comedians a chance. And so. uh with that vision and that idea, we can eventually come up with the underground railroad kings of comedy because we can't be the kings of comedy because we already have the kings, but we can be the underground railroad kings. And, and so that that would be something that I think could could continue on like Def Comedy Jam. So that's that concept. No, nah, that, that's perfect, man. I mean, that's a beautiful thing, too. So I like that. I, I can't wait to see how it takes off because that's uh... – that's smart, you know. Yes, sir. And, and, I want to recreate good. the Negro League. So yeah, man. If you see my shirt, man, I'm 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 trying to recreate the Negro League, man. Okay. So uh, so that's whether that's in comedy, football, basketball, little league, and so. Got to come to Kansas City. We got to get you over to, oh, to the actual Negro League. Oh yes, sir. And so and so and so with the streaming deal, uh, I'm partnering and, and collabing uh with the with the young kid Aiden Ross, which is one of the biggest streamers. Yep. yep. Uh, in, in the world, so so he and I do a lot of great content together. We got a lot of we got a great chemistry. Uh, his audience love us together, and so it gives me access to more youth, it, the, the hearts and the mind of our youth, which is 100 of our future. And so I'm 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 everybody's favorite uncle on the internet now. We are going to talk football and politics in just a second, but uh, Cheryl Dozier wanted me to talk to you about your philanthropic efforts, you know, because I know it's very important and very near and dear to you. So tell us some of the some of the efforts that you're out here doing. Oh. Uh, I, I never stopped working with the youth. Uh, I, I, I just expanded. And, and so when I travel to different cities, uh, I'm going to I I'm make it my business to give a, a portion of my, my back end money back directly off into the communities, uh, whether that's the mothers who have, have buried their children to gun violence or uh, whether that's going into a school uh, and, 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 and walking into a classroom or gym and, and, and looking at the kid who has the, the ugliest shoes on his feet and secretly slide them some money and, and, and say, man, go get you some new shoes and, and watching the response when they see how much money I gave them. Um, I, I, I learned in, in inner, inner city schools with black children, uh, you can change a lot of children's lives if you build from the feet up. Yeah. And so I've been working with kids for over 12 years. Uh, I actually started in like officially documentation in 2012. Uh, I watched my mother be a foster parent uh, for over 20 some years after she retired from General Motors uh, to some of, some of the most some of the most good children, some some of the most greatest children in the world, but had been through some, some horrific situations. And I watched my mother nurture them. I grew up in a boy's home with, with other kids who had dealt with traumatic childhood. Uh, so I've always had a heart for children uh, who struggle. And so I just grew up to became uh, what I needed and, and what I desired to have as a kid. Uh, somebody in my community uh, that 
that could show me the way without tricking me. Mm. And so uh, I just became the change that I wanted to see in the community. Uh, I, cre I created a youth organization that started out as a 501c3. Uh, I eventually ended up reading a book that was given to me by the executive director of the Annie Casey Foundation, which was a guy by the name of Bart LeBeau at the time. And the book was called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded. And it talked about and, and it broke down and explained a term that that they used that was called the, the nonprofit industrial complex. Mm. Uh, after I read that book, I no longer felt the need to have a 501c3 status and just created a youth organization, a youth outreach that could self-sustain itself without looking for grants and donations to help other people. And, and so that's what I did. And, and to this day, I've been working with kids. Uh, I've never uh, applied for a grant or a donation. I've never posted my cash app online and, and asked and somebody to send me. So I've always said this is what I'm doing. And, and based uh, on the consistency of, of what I was doing, how long I was doing it, and the character of, of who I was as a person to the community, the community joined in and, and started supporting me and helping me. So I would never have to ask. I, I'm going to speak this on that. That's, that's, that's a beautiful thing, man. How can... Give us more information. How can people find out more about what you're doing in that? Oh, man, man, I, I, I ask people to, uh, at this point, they have to research now because my, my social media videos and, and my social media antics and rhetoric have, have superseded in metaverse world my actual community work. So if you Google my name, Charleston White, hyped about hype, and that's H Y P E D about H Y P E. And hype is an acronym for helping young people excel. If you Google that, man, there's a ton of information about the work that I've done. Oh, I, I've been on the front page of the American Bar Association Journal uh, about the legislation work that we did to get juvenile life without parole abolished. Uh, I, I've 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 partnered and 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 done the study with the the Walter Conkright School. Uh, of journalism in Arizona, News 21, and that was a recent study uh, on fa on father on fatherlessness in, in America. That was like three years ago. So these are recent studies. Uh, I've done trainings for the United States Department of Homeland Security and Human Trafficking Division, yeah. North Texas Crime Commission. So uh, this is who I was prior to the internet. I, I came to the internet. The internet became my outlet. So that's why a lot of times I seem angry, man. I hate you. So that was my outlet. So when I end, that stays there. Uh, I, 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 trying to learn the internet, I learned me. Mm. So, 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 try not to beg. Try not to be a black person that's asking for donations, that's criticizing other black people for not helping me online because that's where I was going. So. They said, well, man, you get paid for being on social media. So trying to understand the monetization of Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, I learned something about me. I'm funny because I'm, 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 I'm researching the Internet, so I have to engage the algorithm. I have to pay attention to the comments. So the comments became not just an audience but a demographics. Right. Because they're giving you these analytics on, on, on these social media sites. Yeah. So as I'm trying to learn this, I'm people are saying you're funny. I'm saying I ain't funny. I'm cussing you out because this is my outlet to be frustrated. Right. But I'm also trying to monetize. it. So I started listening to what people would say is your audience. A supply and demand kind of theory. So, OK, I'm funny. So I would watch my videos and laugh at my videos. Oh, no, that's right. And so I discovered that, OK, I am funny. So that's how I ended up being able to navigate through this and not get stuck on social media as an angry black man with this negative rhetoric. So then the Internet starts saying, oh, you look like Cat Williams. Oh, you a snitch, Rat Williams. Well, rather than being offended by the term Rat Williams, I made it a character. Mm. That's the Internet character, Rat Williams. It'll cuss you out and say all these horrible things. So then they start saying, oh, you Uncle Ruckers, you hateful. You don't like this. So I became a Uncle Ruckers. So that's where Unc come from. So I came up with Chicken Shit Charlie, Uncle Charlie. He don't like nothing to nobody but white folk. So mm. the Internet started showing me what they wanted. I created these characters. And so that's how I ended up on stage in the movies. Oh, Jason Winlock would love you. Uh, <laughs> 
We're joined by Charleston White here on Radio Row on location in Las Vegas, Nevada. Kansas City Chiefs take on the San Francisco 49ers tomorrow at Allegiant Stadium. All right, let's switch topics and talk some sports. They want to talk football? I'm Andy Reid. Yeah, yeah, I'm Andy Reid all day. Okay, tell me. Uh, I mean, I, I get a sense, but I don't like to sue. How does tomorrow's game look to you? Well, what's the, give, me your, give me your thought process on the game. I'm going with the mulatto quarterback. Yeah, I'm going with the mulatto quarterback that can't nobody seem to beat but Tom Brady. I can't stand you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going with the Melodian. Uh, yeah, 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 God, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's some about it's some about uh uh that Holmes. Means, yeah, yeah it's some about Holmes. And and let me just say this: I remember Mike Vick came home from prison. Yeah. And Andy Reid was one of the first people to give him a chance. I've been an Andy Reid fan ever since. Yeah. Had a, um, he was there for four years, and only that. He's one of the few players, I think one of the two players that uh, I think actually, you know, the players had two $100 million deals. Yeah. So, yeah, no, nah, that's uh, – and he was actually at practice on Friday, so. Okay. Yeah. I re- and then I didn't realize, man, uh, this, this Patrick's what, fourth, third or fourth time coming to the Super Bowl? Four, such a, four Super Bowl in five seasons. At such a young age. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, they said, he, yeah, he, he the new Brady, so. Uh, but I'm going with him and Andy. Okay, you got the score? Uh, uh-uh. man, the boy can throw the ball all kind of ways. Yeah, he can throw on I'm the just side. In case I decide to take your take your advice and go, uh, go, go play a slip or something. Oh, uh, it's a low scoring game. What? Yeah, yeah, just go be a low scoring game. Yeah, oh. defense win championship. Just go be a low scoring game. Yeah, Chiefs this year. I mean, the defense for the Chiefs has been superb. Like they don't get to Super Bowl without that defense this year. Yeah. So no, I, I'm with you on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I gotta ask you. Look, this week there were. Uh, discussions at the NFL commissioners uh, press conference this week. I got a chance to ask the commissioner a question. Oh, wow. Uh, as it relates to the lack of, well, they had zero black news editors, zero black producers, just zero, zero, zero blacks in the news media news news group. And when I asked him why that is, mind you now, Jim Trotter had asked that question the last two seasons. And, and he ignored him. He, uh, he ignored him. So I picked up the torch and and asked that question, and he he started talking about how you know across the league and people of color and minorities. I'm like, that's not what I asked you. I asked you about yeah. blacks. Yeah. Your thoughts on the commissioner? You know, basically sidestepping that once again. Oh, uh, we got to ask him again. Oh, uh, we can't wait to the Super Bowl to, to to hold his feet to the fire. Yeah, but 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 the problem is. You don't get a chance to really talk to the commission too much. And then those that do have partnerships with the NFL, so they're not going to ask that question. If you can't beat them, you join them. If you can't beat them, you join them. Uh, there, there, there has to be a union uh, for us in that department with the NFL. So, so I say we call on Jay-Z to ask him. Because they gave Jay-Z access to doing a halftime show at one point, right? They yeah. were listening to Jay-Z at one point in time, right? Yeah. So we asked Jay-Z to ask him. We 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 create a coalition. We we create a group. We we create something uh that demands an answer to this question. Uh everybody else can. Yeah. Uh but it we have to we have to do it in numbers. And that's that's what seems to be impossible. We can't collectively do it at one time for just one cause. The National Association of Black Journalists has requested another interview again with the commissioner regarding that particular uh, uh, case study. And at the moment, he's it's just it's just you know gone by the way. It's mute. Yeah, it's mute. It's acting like it, it's just like when my woman asked me something, and I ain't got a lie for it. I just don't answer. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? I ain't got a lie for it. You're right about that. I ain't got time thinking it. I just don't answer. I act like she didn't say nothing. Now, what is this about Charleston White for President 2024? Uh, I, I, I want to put my name on the ballot uh, for if nothing else to just. Uh, what party? Uh, independent. I, but, I'm a, but I'm a conservative. So by nature, I, by nature, I would have to be a Republican. But uh, by, by morals and principles, I'm a conservative at heart. Uh, I have conservative values uh, by my mother's teaching. 
Mm. So so naturally and, and typically I have I've ha- I have voted Republican b- because those are the more conservative principles and values. When when I look at my my spiritual beliefs uh and, and my moral compass in the constitution that I stand on as a man, uh it, it points me in this direction for this party. But but what I'm saying for the young people, which is 100 percent of our future, they don't belong to neither party. But could both parties have excluded our youth? Both parties have excluded our youth. And the bipartisan, the lack of bipartisanship, the 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 lack. That sounds good in theory, but there's no such thing as bipartisanship. I, I know. I'm trying to pick the right words. But because our elders who, who say that they're from these two different parties, they remind me of a baby mama and a baby daddy who just refuse to get along and to work against each other's feelings, but for the best interest of the child. So baby mama and baby daddy tends to work against the best interest of the child to right. appease our interests, our personal feelings. And, and that's what's happening with our politicians. They're, they're working against the best interests of our future and our children uh, for a fight today. Before we get out of here, what do you want people to take away from, from our discussion today? Uh, that I'm not a Chief fan, that I'm an Andy Reid fan. Uh, and and I'm a lotto fan, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I got I got a lot of children. <laughs> uh but uh the man that Cam Newton brought to the world is the man I was trying to hide from the world. Uh Cam Newton pressed me on, on a lot of issues. And, and 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 in that video, uh you see me get angry. Uh I became vulnerable. My voice cracked. There was times I would want to cry, uh, because because I felt like he unfairly challenged me. He unjustly, uh, that was supposed to be a shaming process. And and and, and I said some things that 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 dug up some some old bones that that uncovered some old wounds, uh. And and it, it affected my life personally, but it was it was something that I think that that people needed to see that uh, I'm I'm not the 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 eight minute viral sensation guy that you hear saying all these mean hateful things. Uh, I've never killed nobody, but I served time for murder. I participated in it. Um, I've never raped nobody. I've never been accused of rape. Uh, but I talk like I've done it. Uh, I'm acting. Uh, satire comedy. Uh, the things that you see me come to the internet and do, uh, I studied, I researched, uh, I watched old comedians, I watched movies. So I understand that some of the things I say is vulgar. And I say, man, I watched Andrew Dice Clay, mm-hmm. Red Fox, Richard Pryor. Uh, I get some of my satire comedy uh, from Howard Stern before XM Radio. Yep. So I, I studied all of this. Uh, I was sneaking and listening to Ma Mabel, and she got a dirty mouth. So I saw Dolomite. I grew up watching Dolomite. So it gave me an idea. I didn't know if it would work. So I came to the Internet to see if these ideas would work, uh, and, and it worked. And, and what ended up happening was people got stuck on the character and, and forget this man. Uh, who's been working with children for a long time and I've never been accused of doing anything wrong to children, to women, nor to my community. Uh, So uh, I think by now uh, people have their minds made up despite of what's really out there about me. So uh, just keep enjoying the show because it's great entertainment. How can people follow you on social media? Uh, My my Instagram page is the real Charleston White 46. Uh, my Facebook is uh, Charleston White, but they got a lot of fake pages. So just look for my fan page, Charleston White fan page. It's a private page, so you have to join. Uh, I'm on I'm on TikTok, uh, the official Charleston TikTok. Uh, and just be listening for me in the airwaves by way of Green Room Radio, the game-related podcast, streaming out of Vegas. Are you on uh, X as well? Uh, no, not yet. And, and so I want people to uh, – I'm partnering with Aiden Ross, and so we're going to be doing more philanthropy work uh, in the inner cities. Uh, 
uh, with some of, with some of our babies. Uh, so we should bring some different content to the airwaves. Uh, he's a great kid. Uh, black children love him. I travel all around this country as soon as I hit them high school, even the juvenile facilities. They be saying, Unk, what's up with you and Aiden Ross? And so because of Aiden Ross, uh, Say Cheese TV, uh, DJ Academics, uh, DJU, uh, I, I, I've been given access to some of our largest youth audience outside of Disney and Nickelodeon because of these guys. So I, I'm grateful for that. Well, I am grateful for your time. Mr. Charleston White, thank you so very much. Thank you, brother. I've got to get out of here. I've <laughs> got a, a, a long day tomorrow covering the Super Bowl. Charleston White, the great Charleston White. Make sure, of course, uh, you follow him on social media. Make sure you watch his movies. Uh, go, go see him when he comes to town. Thank you so very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. We are uh, – make sure you tune in tomorrow for the pregame cheat sheet with myself and Steve Walls as we get you prepared for the San Francisco 49ers taking on the Kansas City Chiefs in Super Bowl 58. We are out of here.